Okay, welcome back to Chapter 4 of Homer Madison Kem, the People's Congressman. Our story is about this guy, Congressman from Nebraska, Homer Madison Kem. He was a populist, and in Chapter 3, we learned about his exciting election and how he took it took out the incumbent Republican, and now he's on his way to Washington. So this is Chapter 4 of Omar Madison Kem, the People's Congressman. I'm your narrator, Chris Christensen. I'm the great-great-grandson of Omar Madison Kem, and this book was written uh, as a master's thesis at Creighton University by Deloyd John Guth, who is now a professor uh, at the University of Manitoba in Canada. So we're going to start again with chapter four. I hope you enjoyed chapter three, chapter two, chapter one. Please like and subscribe and share as many people. We need to get to a thousand subscribers so we can put even more great content. We've got lots and lots and lots of stuff about Omer Madison Kem. This is his biography. Later on, we're going to talk about some of the other um, important historical documents he left with us. So we're going to continue with the story today of Omer Madison Kem, the People's Congressman, populist from Nebraska, and this is chapter four titled, The Farmer's Advocate Goes to Washington. As if to show that Farmer Kem had come of age as a politician, he directed his first official action to his supporters. In a public letter printed in the party press, Congressman-elect Kem gratefully acknowledged the confidence placed in him by his fellow farmers. In all sincerity, Kem stated that, I owe my present position to the great common people, from them, of them, and by them. I belong to them, and everything I can do for their welfare shall be done. Moreover, he warned that the farmers must not rest on their laurels of 1890. Rather, he declared, we have taken hold of the plow and let him who looks back perish. With this latter bit of advice in mind, Omer Madison Kem planned an early trip to Washington, D.C., but first stopped in Omaha for the meeting of the Northern Farmers Alliance on January 27, 1891. The purpose of the Omaha Conference was to assess the political victories won by independent candidates like Kem in the states surrounding Nebraska. Thanks to his own election victory, Omar Kem had been selected as a delegate at large. He did not take a conspicuous part in the proceedings of the conference and did not even obtain public recognition of his presence, although he was and would remain loyal to the Alliance movement, Kem had little to do with the actual machinery of the national organization. His strength lay in Custer County and in western Nebraska, and he never played more than a minor role in the Northern Alliance. Kem had witnessed and aided the transition of the Alliance into the People's Party, and after 1890, the Alliance organization at all levels was pushed aside as an entity in itself. Omer Kem correspondingly withdrew from the Alliance movement at the same time. Whatever attention he did get in the waning Alliance came by way of his seat in Congress and not because of his playing organizational politics. In subsequent years, he came to depend for his support less on the Alliance than upon his personal popularity with his farmer constituents. Following the three-day Alliance meeting, Kem joined the other congressmen-elect in Lincoln. He, William A. McKeegan of the 2nd District and William Jennings Bryant of the 1st District, then traveled by train to the nation's capital, leaving from Lincoln about the 1st of February. At Washington, they obtained housing for the next winter in a hotel and then made attempts to familiarize themselves with their future jobs. With their certificates of election in hand, they observed the governmental machinery in action at all levels. They spent one week on and off the floor of the House and Senate where Omer Kem, in conjunction with McKeegan, lobbied for $50,000 worth of seed to be distributed among the drought-ridden drought -ridden Nebraska farmers. On his return to Broken Bow, Kem wrote another letter for the party press again damning the forces of the money power which have steadily tightened their grip on the purse strings of the nation. 
He described the existing situation in Washington as a battle of greed versus production, and once more promised to do all in his power to restore an economic balance in favor of the farmer. On his return trip from Washington, Omer Madison Kemp had stopped in Indiana to visit his relatives. Then, in June of 1891, after attending a meeting at Cincinnati to consider organizing a national independent party, he again went back to his boyhood home to be with his dying brother, Randolph. While there, he received his first governmental draft for $416.20, in payment for the travel expenses incurred during his February trip to Washington. After the death of his brother, Kem returned to Broken Bow with the intention of depositing his check in the local bank, but only several days before his return, the bank had failed. Now, more than ever before, Kem realized the dangerous ramifications of the economic plight of his region. The bank failure further confirmed his belief in the impeding, impending calamity against which he had so effectively howled. Once again, a personal involvement with the common predicament facing Western farmers brought a special note of urgency to Kem's demands for financial reform. But since the new Congress would not meet until December of 1891, barring a presidential call for a special session, Kemp's crusade at the national level would have to wait. He had ample time for recreation during the summer and fall, and he made good use of this first opportunity to take vacation from all worldly chores. He and his second wife, Allie, decided to take a two-month trip into northwestern Nebraska, Wyoming, and Montana. For the congressman-elect, the tour meant a respite from farming and political campaigning, and for his wife, it was almost a belated honeymoon. Leaving Broken Bow in June, they traveled by horse and wagon, camped out under the stars, and did just enough hunting and fishing to meet their immediate needs. They stopped off for a visit to the Custer Battlefield on the Little Bighorn River in the new state of Montana. The Kems' ability to take such a trip clearly indicated their sudden rise above the level of mere subsistence. Upon their return in mid-August, Omer Kem took several speaking engagements and then made final preparations to assume his duties in Washington. Kem's second trip in 1891 to the nation's capital placed him in a situation far removed from his environs of western Nebraska. Since he had no personal contacts in Washington, Kem had taken a room in one of the local hotels, but at the same time, he also made the personal acquaintance of a certain Dr. T.A. Bland. This man had written Kem shortly after his election, inquiring about the several Indian tribes living in the Big Third. Kem met the Bland family and decided to rent their second-floor bedroom since their house was only five blocks from the congressional buildings. At the same time, Kem discovered that the Blands avidly practiced spiritualism. He had come in contact with the occult when his own family had lived in Indiana. But in Nebraska, he had attended his wife's church. Now, however, he decided that spiritualism deserved special and independent scrutiny. Kem quickly developed a personal fascination for it, and its mysticism came to dominate him for the rest of his life. Spiritualism held both a scientific and modern appeal, but for Omer Madison Kem, it also had a special attraction due to his long-standing distrust of a formalized Christianity. Thanks to his mediumistic powers exhibited by thanks to the mediumistic powers exhibited by the Blands, Omer Kem could depend upon a constant contact with the spirit world. Slate writing, in his opinion, by spirits particularly appealed to Kem, and through it he received messages from deceased members of his family. In addition, he found through several notes received on the slate that he had the support of the late Senator Benjamin F. Wade for his agrarian crusade. The occult powers really outdid themselves, however, when Kem received an unsolicited message from Abraham Lincoln. The message read, Dear Sir, my ideal of a government was one that should be in fact of the people, by the people, and for the people. 
a radical change must be effected before the government can even approximate the right, the true, and the good to all whose inheritance of a common right shall be equal. Truly, A. Lincoln. From such messages, Kemp could gain renewed confidence both in his agrarian crusade and in his belief in spiritualism. He attended weekly seances throughout his six-year term in office and experienced visions and visitations frequently. At the Bland home, mediums and manifestations flourished, providing a rewarding atmosphere to which to retire after a long day on the hill. On December 7, 1891, the 52nd Congress opened and Kem's public career began. Once established in Washington, Kem quickly adapted to his new role as a farmer's advocate in Congress. He met with the other Alliance elected and pledged members in a caucus organized to promote political unity. The main issue was the impending election for Speaker of the House, and the alliance had already bound its representatives to support neither the Republicans nor Democratic candidates. When Congress met on December 8th, Kem and seven other Western independents agreed to obey the alliance directive by voting for Thomas E. Tom Watson of Georgia. But all the alliance-backed Southern congressmen except Watson bolted the alliance caucus to vote for the successful Democratic candidate, Representative Charles F. Crisp of Georgia. The Republicans, who had normally controlled the House since the Civil War, thus sank into minority status. But for Kim, this shift of power between the old parties denoted a change of hands, but not of heart. Kem, by his very first vote, had shown himself to be an agrarian rebel against both traditional parties. The cost of Omer Madison Kem's radicalism quickly became clear. After the organization of the House, he and Tom Watson took segregated seats on the extreme right of the Republican section. Kem's open declaration of war against both political parties netted him relative anonymity when it came time for the committee assignments to be made. Although his assignments were fitting and pertinent to his personal background and to the interests of his constituents, Kem's seats on the Committee on Indian Affairs and on expenditures in the Department of Agriculture would give him only slight influence over the general business of the House. True, he fared better than that bolting Democrat Tom Watson, whom the Democratic majority banished to the committees dealing with the census and the militia. Yet, on the other hand, Kem saw his Democratic colleague, William Jennings Bryan, take Dorsey's old place on the Powerful Ways and Means Committee. Both Kem and Bryan were unknown in Congress, and both had been elected by and as Western radicals. Bryan, however, had now reaped his reward for placing loyalty to party above loyalty to the alliance in the recent contest over the speakership. Nevertheless, Kem found in Bryan both a sympathetic and helpful hand at, as the first session of the 52nd Congress got down to business. Both were neophytes to Washington politics, but Bryan did possess a political advantage by virtue of the fact that he belonged to the ruling Democratic Party. During the next three years, Kem found many an occasion to trade on Bryan's growing political prestige. Moreover, Kem's marked tendencies towards fusion with the Western Democrats, coupled with Bryan's increasing agrarian sympathies, gave a middle ground upon which Kem could hope to escape from congressional anonymity. As Bryan's reputation grew, both as a politician and as an orator, Kem came to rely more and more on his colleague from Nebraska, especially for the chance to obtain recognition from the chair. Clearly, however, no close personal relationship ever existed between Kem and Bryan. In terms of actual political allegiance, Omer Madison Kem kept close to the coattails of Tom Watson. The two had much in common beside their alliance affiliations 
for both came from the school of flamboyant, stump-speaking oratory. Yet, Omer Kem lacked the color of either Watson or of that Western Independent Congressman Sockless Jerry Simpson of Kansas. The young journalist, Hamlin Garland, provided vivid descriptions of the latter two, but reported that Kem had a sort of smileless gravity about him, which reflected the hard condition of the people he represented. Of this, Kem could be most proud, for he was the only genuine dirt farmer among these three agrarian representatives. Throughout his first term in Congress, Kem followed the leads of Watson and Simpson, becoming a party man because it proved consistent with his personal ideals. He could offer the little band of congressional populists the benefit of his contacts with Bryan and a personal dedication which caused a friendly editor to describe him as a dagger to monopoly. Omer Kem never gave any cause for his constituents to doubt his wholehearted antagonism towards the monopoly ends of the two old parties. However, his association with the People's Party of the USA never was as strong as his established relationship with the Congressional Independents. On May 14, 1890, he had attended an independent convention held in Cincinnati, which had been called to consider the possibility of organizing on the national level. Later, on February 19th of 1892, Kem received a congressional leave of absence for urgent business in St. Louis. At this meeting, he witnessed the formation of the National Party, known thereafter as the Populist Party. But in both instances, Omer Kem did not take an active part in the proceedings. He never obtained any national political prominence in either alliance or party circles, and what is more, he never made any attempts in that direction. Personally, he believed that the possibility of fusion with the Western Democrats had to be considered as one dependable way in which to ensure the enactment of political and economic reform. Kem's main concern centered around the overthrow of the Republican dominance and the restoration of political control to the hands of the agrarians. As a result, he had a pragmatic attitude which demanded both considerable detachment from the National Alliance Party and a personal attempt to maintain his own individuality and independence. Congressman Kem had taken little time in establishing himself as an individualist and a radical in the House of Representatives. And likewise, he let little grass grow under his sod-busting feet once the Congress settled down to its legislative business. On January 5, 1892, he introduced his first bill, providing for a total revamping of the nation's financial system. As in the campaign of 1890, Kem maintained that the supply of money available to the public had been deliberately sustained at low levels to the detriment of mortgagers and farmers like himself. The platform on which he had been elected demanded the free coinage of silver since this addition to the national currency would naturally increase the money supply. The Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890 had already provided for four and one half million ounces of silver to be bought each month at the market price, but the Republican administration had refused to use the silver to redeem federal notes and had continued to prevent inflation by backing the currency with gold. While the national banks also issued notes, these two were limited in total quantity by the supply of federal bonds which the law required the banks to own as a reserve for their notes. As a matter of fact, less dollars circulated in 1890 than had in 1865, even though the population had doubled and the volume of business had trebled in the same period. Therefore, Omar Kem decided to start a program of general financial reform with a revision of the system of state and national banks. Since Kem wished to safeguard the money which Westerners did possess, Kem's first bill provided for the establishment of a general system of federally operated banks. In this way, he would drive out the wildcat and fly-by-night banks and mortgage companies, hoping at the same time to protect his constituents from high and fluctuating interest rates through a stability gained by government control. 
Omer Kim's first proposal in Congress also allowed for an adequate volume of full legal tender coin and paper money. This did not necessarily dictate the use of silver coin, but it did mean that Kim wanted the supply of money inflated to a point which would aid his penurious farmer constituents. Later, his wrath for the loosely organized system of banking would lead him to support all measures calling for a congressional investigation of, as well as a tax on, the circulation of money by the many banks set up across the country. Kem's original bill died a natural death in committee, but he continued to flood the hopper with many variations which would provide the same basic reforms. Omer Kem made the financial issue into one of the main themes of his first address to Congress. On February 27, 1892, the short and swarthy redhead from the plains rose to make his maiden speech in which he lodged a vehement indictment of past government treatment of the Indians. Although this was the principal issue before the House, Kem quickly diverged into an attack upon the source of revenue on which the Indian Appropriations Bill depended. In a well-prepared speech, the fiery-eyed Kem first damned the selfish and greedy Indian agents and laconically pointed out that it was much easier to feed an Indian than to fight him. Then he forthrightly attacked the House for traditionally burdening the poorer classes with most of the taxes needed to feed the Indian and all over and all other dependents on the federal budget. Moreover, he vigorously demanded an end to the exploitation of the masses by the railroads with their excessive freight rates, by the national banking corporations, and by all of the other institutions of robbery. In the process of developing this theme, Kem successfully fought off the harassing tactics of three Republicans by giving short and gentlemanly replies to their seemingly inane questions. Thus, the 36-year-old Kem's first attempt at oratory on the floor of the House was an open challenge to the vested interests and their exploitation of the money of the people. More significant than the fact of the speech itself was the gleeful reception which it received in Nebraska's 3rd District. The Alliance newspapers dramatized Kemp's feud with the Republicans and singled out Congressman Edward Hogue Funston of Kansas as his chief adversary. In the course of Kemp's address, Funston had offered to bet the Nebraskan that the interest on federal bonds had been made taxable. After raising Funston's original offer of a wager to $50, the red-headed populace had proved his point by citing the relevant legislation. Kem had then readily accepted the fruits of victory and had deposited Funston's 50 Republican dollars in the coffers of the populist party. The Alliance papers cheered the education which Kem had given to one of the Wall Street bootlickers. In addition, one of, the Kem, one of Kem's constituents wrote a poem and eulogy of this triumph over the Republicans, which began as follows. "'Twas when the hosts of Mammon in the Congress of our land were arrayed against our plowmen in a struggle hand to hand, when they strove to save their idol with their sophistry and gaff, as they bowed in humble homage to the banker's golden calf, when they bleated for his calfship, who by Kem was sorely pressed, as he pled the cause of labor and of all who are oppressed. Then a member known as Funston tried to check the rushing torrent, as the plowman told them how U.S. bonds were free from tax, but not so the poor man's cow. Then our gallant plowman read him from the statutes of the calf how the nation's very lifeblood had been made the banker's staff. With such popular reaction, Omer Madison Kem could look forward to continuing endorsement of his fight for financial reform by the Congress. The financial issue, including both governmental policy and practice, confronted Congressman Kem in the form of various and sundry proposals before the House. He wanted an inflated currency, and once the issue of free silver was introduced, Kem accepted it as the real answer to the inadequate money supply which had crippled the farmer. 
The populists and Western Democrats sought to force the issue, hoping to garner enough joint support to ram the proposal down the Republicans' throats. Therefore, as early as March 7, 1892, Kemp joined his colleagues from Nebraska in a move to force a special ordering of the Silver Bill. Under the leadership of Richard Bland of Missouri, Kemp and the other Silverites obtained recognition even though the bill eventually returned to the congressional pigeonhole. On March 25th, the bill did come out of committee, but it then had to survive the many motions to reconsider, table, recess, and adjourn. When Bland finally gave up, agreeing to adjournment, Kim and the others retired in disgust. Although obsessed with the financial issue, Kim faced questions of foreign policy with a similarly sectional and provincial attitude. The first major issue confronting the House had come up on January 6th, 1892, when the Senate resolution reached the floor calling for the shipment of food to the starving Russians. Kim voted for an amendment providing for shipment by the Navy, but the bill died through a motion for indefinite postponement. Obviously, Congressman Kim welcomed any opportunity to open new markets for farm products, even if it meant purchase of grain by the federal government for a mission of mercy to Tsarist Russia. On other questions of foreign policy, Kim adhered to the principle that the only pertinent concern of the government should be for its own people, who Kim generally equated with the farmers. He consistently voted against all appropriations for a railway canal survey to be made in Nicaragua, for the only immediate beneficiary in Kim's eyes would be the eastern shipping interests. Another question before the House involving foreign policy Kim opposed the flooding of the American labor market for the most part however the first session of the 52nd Congress faced problems of domestic import and in every case Kim viewed his decision in terms of its impact on the Western farmers Although the issue of United States tariff policy did contain certain foreign ramifications, Kem approached it from a purely domestic point of view. His election in 1890 had meant popular endorsement of his call for drastic tariff reform, and his subsequent voting record in Congress marked an attempt to hammer this demand into law. On April 5, 1892, the question of repealing the tariff on wool, which the McKinley Bill of 1890 had raised above the 50% level, revived the East-West conflict over protectionism. Kem helped in voting down various Republican attempts to delay action through repeated quorum calls and motions for recess. Two days later, the bill passed with Kem voting in the majority. Another tariff, this one on binding twine, could be felt by Nebraska farmers through higher prices for these harvest supplies, and he thus voted for its reduction. Congressman Kemp continued to view the tariff as a colossus built for the interests of big business and consistently supported Bryan's fight for freer trade. These pop-gun bills, to which reductions in the tariffs on tin and lead were later added, all passed thanks to the Western Coalition of Populists and Democrats. In all cases, Kemp's adamant anti-tariff attitude reflected his vehement animosity and distrust towards anything which did not directly benefit his constituent farmers. Another variation upon Kemp's anti-Republican, anti-monopoly theme was his attack upon federal land policies. On May 10th, he pioneered attempts to establish a policy of irrigation projects to be set up in western Nebraska, but his main concern was with the securing of better opportunities for cheap land for any farmers wanting to homestead as he had done. On June 29th, Congressman Kemp took to the floor with a plea to halt the monopolizing of western lands by the corporations, syndicates, and trusts. Throughout the first session, he demanded the outright forfeiture of all railroad land grants and further attacked the railroads by asking for an inquiry into their postal service. By associating the hated railroads with the question of western land, he could often simultaneously hit two targets. 
As in his attack on existing land policies, Kem generally concentrated on negative demands for the elimination of what he deemed economic abuses. Hence, he assailed the agricultural marketing system and pictured the middleman as an opulent Easterner whose dealings sapped the lifeblood of the laboring farmers. He supported measures which would rigidly regulate and tax trading in agricultural options and futures also sometimes opposed exploitation of labor by business. He voted for an eight-hour law for all non-farming workers, and with the recent homestead strike still fresh in mind, Kem supported a resolution demanding an investigation and condemnation of the use of Pinkerton agents by employers. Kem thus sought to make common cause with the servants of big business against their master and his foe. Kim also supported political and constitutional reforms tending towards greater democracy. Shortly after his vote for statehood for Arizona, which would have increased Western strength in Congress, he backed a plan to increase the role of the people as a whole in their government. Thanks to the gift of 20 minutes of Brian's speaking time, Kim had an opportunity to endorse a proposal for the direct election of senators. He contended that under the existing system of electing senators by the state legislatures, it was always possible for those who have their millions to bribe one, five, ten, or twenty votes, even in order to accomplish their ends. But he cried it was not possible to bribe a whole state, and hence he advocated for the popular election of members of the upper house. In addition, Kemp favored the popular election of the president, thus eliminating the middleman in the guise of the Electoral College. Upholding the right of the people to govern themselves, he contended that only popular rule could remove the money power from political domination. On July 29, 1892, the Honorable Omer Madison Kemp retired from the congressional battleground to give an accounting of his stewardship to the common people. He had not taken the time to attend the National Convention of the People's Party at Omaha on July 4, 1892, but he had taken the time in the midst of the recurring debate on free silver to join with the other populist congr congressmen in a telegram of support and greetings to the delegates. The Populist Convention had completely endorsed his activities in the 52nd Congress and had put forth the famous Omaha Platform, which outlined the very same solution to economic and political woes that Congressman Kem had voted and spoken for in the House. Thus, when Kem finally took a leave of absence from Congress on account of illness, he could return to Broken Bow on a wave of public support. A further endorsement from a Kearney meeting of his own constituents on August 3rd gave Kem the assurance of renomination by the People's Party. The expected nomination for a second term came by acclamation without competition or a solitary dissenting vote. The calamity howling crusader, though without personal victories to his credit, would be allowed another chance. For Kem, the campaign of 1892 differed greatly from that of two years earlier. The Big Third had been redistricted in 1891 by the populist-controlled state legislature. The new arrangement, based on an expansion of Nebraska's congressional delegation from three to six members, reduced the size of his district by eliminating its eastern third and redesignated it as the sixth district. In 1890, Kem had had to fight as an independent against a strong Republican machine backing the incumbent, but in 1892, he was the incumbent with an effective farmer-supported network behind him. Moreover, Kem had a National Alliance Party on which to rely for additional backing. He ran as a populist independent and did not associate himself with the Democrats. Nevertheless, hostile elements of the press charged that Kem, McKeegan, and Bryan had arranged an interchange of Democratic and Populist votes in their respective districts. Kem's opposition came from the same three groups that he had faced in 1890. The Republicans put forth James Whitehead, a lawyer from Broken Bow. The Democrats nom nominated an unknown named A.T. Gatewood 
and the Prohibition Party decided to campaign for Reverend Orlando Beebe. Since the main cause for concern would be the Republicans, Cam immediately challenged Whitehead to a series of 16 debates. In doing so, Kem departed from the traditional refusal of an incumbent to share his platform with an opponent, but by now his individualism and self-confidence would not allow any thoughts of being defeated. Nevertheless, Congressman Kem had to contend with the Republican resurgence from the debacle of 1890, which would win the three newly created seats in Congress. But... On the strength of a heavily agrarian electorate in the 6th District, Omer Kim again emerged with the laurels of victory. He received 16,328 votes. Whitehead got 14,195. The Democrat Gatewood collected only 4,202, while the Prohibition captured a total of 586 votes. Cam's re-election meant substantial support for the role of agrarian rebel which he played in the first session of the 52nd Congress. There, he had fulfilled all of his previous campaign promises, giving the Nebraska farmers exactly the kind of representation they had wanted. In return, the voters of the 6th District had given him a majority support in 17 of the 33 counties in his district. All of the other counties went to the Republican candidate except for one county in which Kim and Whitehead ran a dead heat. Even in the latter counties, Kim still captured slightly more than 39% of the total vote cast, while the Republican gathered only 44% in victory. Once again, Kim ran well in all areas of his district and won his greatest victories in the heavily homesteaded areas around Custer County. Well, this hearty endorsement, or with this hearty endorsement, Kim could return to Congress to renew his attack on the business interests and his search for measures of relief to the farmers. He had condemned the railroads, the banking interests, and the tools of Wall Street in Congress with the same spirit in which he had spoken out for popular government, the interests of all laborers, and the restoration of an economic balance in favor of the farmer. To this extent, Omer Madison Kem, Congressman Kem, had represented a special interest in opposition to another vested interest, but in his mind, he had represented the larger and nobler group. With this record, Kem had readily gained the renewed approval of his constituents, and the Honorable Omer Madison Kem could return to the second session of the 52nd Congress convinced of the righteousness of his cause and assured of the necessary popular support for the continuation of his crusade. And that is the end of Chapter 4 of Omer Madison Cam, the People's Congressman. Please like and subscribe if you're enjoying the story so far. We're going to switch to another video for Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is going to be entitled The Saga of a Successful Failure. So we're going to hear a little bit about his second term in Congress. We learned some amazing things in this Chapter 4. So um, go back, please like and subscribe. Go back to the website and let's pick up in Chapter 5 of the story of Omer Madison Kim, the People's Congressman, titled The Saga of a Successful Failure. And again, this is written by Deloitte John Guth in 1963 as a master's thesis at Creighton University. That's Omer Madison Kim. That's not Deloitte Guth. But um, Omer Madison Kim was my great-great-grandfather. And again, my name is Chris Christensen. This is my YouTube page. And we are narrating this for the first time. This is brand new political history. I hope you're enjoying it. And um, please come back for Chapter 5 of the Omer Madison Chem story entitled The Saga of a Successful Failure. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.